welcome to this video and in this video I wanted to have a look at the smallest exoplanet that's been discovered so far and it's fairly unusual in the sense that it orbits a white dwarf star which is quite unusual and the planet itself is unusual and the mechanism as to what put it there is also unusual. So it's quite an interesting system this and I wanted to go through that and just show how it was discovered as well. So I'm not going to give its full name, it has a very boring catalog name but the first part is the actual name of the white dwarf that it orbits so the sdss up to the final b is the name of the white dwarf and then the b on the end just denotes that it's the first planet discovered orbiting that particular star and that's how most exoplanets are catalogued unless it's a particularly interesting one that it maybe might have a name or something but anyway this is the smallest known exoplanet so smallest known planet orbiting another star and it has a radius of approximately 60 kilometers now that's very small that's quite small indeed now i've drawn it there kind of as a circle or a, a sphere which is what we think about planets as being shaped like but in reality it's unlikely to be spherical it's actually quite small and this is an asteroid that is a similar size and you can see that it's not spherical at that sort of size they don't have enough gravitational force to mould them into this spherical shape. So whilst I've drawn it like that, that's not necessarily how it would look. And to be honest, we don't know what it looks like shape-wise because we haven't seen it. It wasn't discovered with the transit method. It was with the radial velocity method, which we'll have a look at a bit later in the video. So we, we have no idea kind of on its shape. We've got an idea on its approximate size and orbit and that, but not its shape. So if we look at all of the exoplanets been discovered so far, so there's over 5,000 now that have been confirmed. There's actually probably about 5,000 that are still to be confirmed as planets. They have like candidates, so there's been a signal there to suggest they might be there, but we're around about 5,000 exoplanets at the moment, and there's been a huge explosion in the, in the last few years. Now, if you have a look at the plot of the orbital period against the radius of that particular planet, you get this sort of plot here. Now, if you want to create those yourself, you can go to the Exoplanet Archive and the actual link for that is on the top of that plot if you have a look. So just search for Exoplanet Archive. You can make your own plots. You can have a look at one that I've done here and you can see the whole distribution of planets that have been discovered. And the method they were discovered at is kind of listed in the different color words on the upper right so radial velocity is red transits is green which is most of them but anyway in the context of our planet we're discussing in this video the smallest one it's right to the lower left of that so it has a very very short orbital period it's actually one of the shortest orbital orbital period of any planet and it's also the smallest so it's very close to its star very small its orbital period is actually just over two hours. So that's a very, very short orbital period when you consider, you know, hours is a year. And a lot of the other planets are at least on the order of days. So this one is a very short orbital period, which means it's very close to its star. Now, the actual planet itself orbits within a debris disk. So there's a disk of material. Think of it a bit like an asteroid belt, but it's a bit denser, really like it's a bit more of a disc like structure and that's orbiting this white dwarf star and the planet is kind of on the inner edge of that now here it's kind of referred to as a planetesimal because it's not really a planet it's it's too small to be actually classified properly as a planet so if you have a look at one of my other videos where we look at the definition of a planet it doesn't have that spherical shape it's too small um so it, it, it would typically be classified as a planetesimal which is what you can see in the diagram here from the original paper that was published and it's very close to a star so it's semi-major axis which is basically the the radius of the orbit around the star is three quarters the radius of the sun so that puts it in context of the sun as to how close it would be if we you know, put it in our own solar system so on this diagram here, the WD is the white dwarf in the centre, the planetesimal is the planet orbiting around, and then that disc-like structure is the disc that it sits in, of that material that's orbiting the white dwarf as well. So to put it in context of our system, it would have an orbit with inside the Sun. So a very, very short orbital period, and it's about three quarters the radius of the Sun, so that just gives you a visual representation really. 
as to the orbit of this particular planetesimal exoplanet. Now it was discovered with the radial velocity technique. Now this is where you look at the light coming from the star and when it's been red shifted or blue shifted it moves, it's moving away or towards us. So when it moves um, away from us the light is red shifted so the wavelength of the light is slightly stretched which makes it redder. When it travels towards us it becomes slightly blue um, so it gets a bit squashed. And by looking at the light giving off by that white dwarf star over a period of time, you can see how it basically gets a little bit redder, a little bit bluer. And that gives us the orbital period of that particular planet. Because we may think of planets orbiting stars, but actually they both orbit a common centre of mass between the two. So it means that the actual star is orbiting a common centre of mass or the barrier centre of the system. So if we measure the star, we can detect the planet. And this was the method used to detect this particular planet. Now, in the context of our solar system, not including our sun, for size-wise, it's about 1% the radius of the Earth. So this is starting to you know, really seem very small indeed. So 1% the radius of the Earth, very, very small. In context of one of Saturn's small moons, it's about the same sort of size. This is Epimetheus. This is a, a small moon of Saturn, and it's approximately 60 kilometer radius and that's an image of it on the right and again this just confirms or suggests that it's unlikely to be spherical in shape but more asteroid shape because it's it's quite small and there's another reason why it might be as well which we'll have a look at later on so it's about the same sort of size as epimetheus of saturn it's actually about a third the radius of saturn's moon mimus now this is a mid-sized moon of saturn and it's responsible for creating the Cassini division in the middle of the rings due to an orbital resonance. So this is still a fairly reasonably small moon. And this is bigger and much bigger, actually. And you can see the Cassini division in your back garden if you've got a, you know, a fairly modest size telescope. And that is caused by this particular moon due to orbital resonances, which I discuss in other videos. So what happened? How did this system come to be? Because it's a very unusual system and it didn't form like that. And we know from stellar evolution that the white dwarf stars are kind of the end point of sun-like stars. So it's likely that this planet orbited a star not that dissimilar to our sun and it likely orbited much further out. So a little bit, it could be similar to some planets in our system, maybe comparable to our own system, um, but much um, earlier on. It may even have had multiple planets. We've only discovered the one orbiting this white dwarf, but it could have had multiple planets much further in or further out. So why are we only seeing one? Well, a sun-like star, when it evolves, it comes off the main sequence, which is when it finishes that hydrogen fusion in its core, it will expand into a red giant so it, it changes the way that it generates energy in its core and it will generate energy in a shell around a helium core and that the hydrogen is being fused in a shell it creates a greater outward pressure against the same amount of gravitational force so it actually expands the star out now our sun will do the same thing at some point and this star would have done the same thing so what happens is that star expands into a red giant if there's any inner planets, so we're talking like Mercury, Venus for our sort of system, they're likely going to get destroyed because it expands a considerable amount and it will basically swallow those and they will be destroyed. The planet that has been discovered, the one that we can actually see now in current day, likely had a evaporation of its atmosphere and outer layers. So illustration there, basically, because the surface of that sun is now so much closer, it's going to get a lot hotter and that will evaporate parts of that planet away. And it's partially kind of survived. Now, when red giants basically come to the end part of that, so they become a planetary nebula. So those outer layers of that red giant gradually are lost. And these are some examples of planetary nebulas. Those outer layers are lost. And it will leave behind a collapsed core in the center, which is then the white dwarf star. So you get this hot central core, which would have been the core of the star, but it's now 
it's not undergoing any fusion in its core, but it's it still remains very hot and it's collapsed because there's no outward pressure to hold it up and it collapses due to electron degeneracy. So that's what leaves us our white dwarf in the center. And then these outer layers kind of dissipate. But if you have to think about a planetary system, these planetary nebulas are obviously quite well, they're significantly sized because we can see them quite quite well, whereas we can't really image stars that are very far away. So they, these planetary systems would have been orbiting in this, in all this material. Now what this can do is when the star expands to red giant phase, loses its outer layers, it can cause a disturbance of the planets. So even if they're not completely destroyed, they're a bit further out, it can dynamically alter the system. So it can destabilize them a little bit. Um, some planets can undergo orbital decay. So maybe the planet in question we've discovered was further out. During this particular phase, it has had an orbital decay and it's moved inwards. So it's gone inwards to the location that we can see now. Now, this part here, planets will either survive, so like the one we, we can see, or they get torn apart by strong tides and they fall onto the white dwarf star. Now, we have actually discovered that happening. Um, we have discovered planets falling onto white dwarf stars. So we know it is a process. Maybe the one we've captured is actually midway through that process because it's so small. Maybe it's actually currently being pulled apart. Now, the actual system in question is kind of a nice illustration here showing it. So you've got the white dwarf at the center. You've then got this debris disk orbiting that white dwarf star. And then you've got this very small planet orbiting in the debris disk. Now, what happens most of the time is that this planet begins to be pulled apart and it causes this disk of material, which then over time falls onto the white dwarf, which is known as accretion. So this is probably what's happening with this planet that's been discovered because it's very small and it's likely being pulled apart. It's, it's kind of in that process at the moment. And what we can see, what we've detected is likely to be just the iron core left behind. So the atmosphere has been evaporated away, the outer layers have been stripped away, and what we found so far is just that iron core, which could represent its small size. So that's the bit that's left behind that we can see now. Now, we have discovered several exoplanets orbiting white dwarfs. Um, they're still very close, and some are in the process of being destroyed. Again, they have these disks. We have found planets falling onto the, onto the actual stars themselves. But more intriguingly, there has been planet found in the habitable zone of a white dwarf. Now, because a white dwarf star is so much smaller, they are very hot surface temperature wise. So they can be, you know, hundreds of times hotter than um, the sun on the surface. But because they're very small then the habitable zone has to be much closer to the star. So we have found some planets in that habitable zone. Now you're probably thinking, well, that would be really exciting. You know, what would life be like there? But that planet's got to go through that phase for the red giant phase, the planetary nebula. It will likely have migrated inwards to that point because the habitable zone would have been too close whilst it went through that red giant phase. So this planet is still not likely to have life on it, but maybe these are interesting places to visit or go later on because a white dwarf star would remain you know hot for a reasonable amount of time so if the planet was suitable in the habitable zone they might be viable to go and investigate later on so thank you for watching and if you enjoy then check out some of the other videos